It's Tuesday, October 12th. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And yesterday on 11 October, a 1979 Twin Cessna 340A went down near San Diego, California, killing the owner, operator, pilot on board, a well-known cardiologist, Dr. Sugata Das, from the Yuma Regional Medical Center, while attempting to fly the ILS runway 28 right at San Diego's Montgomery Field. Here's what we know so far. From the Aviation Safety Network, the aircraft a Cessna 340A owner-operator Samarth Aviation LLC, registration November 7022 Golf. Only one occupant on board, the owner-operator fatally injured. A Cessna 340A was destroyed by fire and impact with a UPS delivery car and residential structures about two miles north-northeast of Gillespie Field Airport. KSEE, -E, that's not the airport that he was attempting to land at, at the intersection of Greencastle and Jeremy Streets, San Diego, El Cajon, California. The pilot sustained fatal injuries. Number of occupants is currently unconfirmed. That's been confirmed now to just the one pilot on board the aircraft was the sole occupant. A UPS delivery driver was fatally injured and two people on the ground sustained serious burn injuries. Two homes were destroyed, three seriously damaged. Let's go inside and listen to some ATC audio tapes and talk about the Cessna 340 and some of the systems on board that aircraft. Starting here with uh, Catherine's report, here's Dr. Sugata Das in a Cessna 172. Looks like he's receiving some flight training in it. And if we come down here, a lot of great links on Catherine's report that, to a lot of great information. Here's some still photographs of the video data that was captured by door ring camera, surveillance cameras. I cannot show the actual video itself. No longer out here on the Blanco Lirio channel. The YouTube is threatening to demonetize my channel permanently as that content, according to YouTube, is not suitable for all advertisers, even though we're here to learn from it. If we take this still picture and zoom in on it, we can see what appears to be all four corners of the aircraft. This is something investigators will always be looking for. There's the two wing tanks, which are the main fuel tanks in the Cessna 340, both engines. The nose and the tail of the aircraft all appear to be intact. And if you go back and listen to the audio on those video recordings, to me, I hear two good engines at climb power or better just prior to impact. A good 45 degrees of bank or more and quite a few degrees nose low. A very high speed, high energy impact. Here's the approximate flight path for this flight from Yuma, Arizona, where the doctor worked back to San Diego, California, where he lived at 200 miles an hour. That's about a short 45 minute flight or so. Here's some pictures of the actual accident aircraft, number November 7022 Gulf, a 1979 Cessna 340A, just a beautiful aircraft. Only 1,860 hours total time since brand new. TSI 0520 Continental engines, those are the turbocharged engines that give you the pressurization for this aircraft. Only 516 hours since major overhaul on both engines recent prop work done and it has the vortex generators which is very common for these aircraft to help reduce vmca your minimum controllable speed on one engine making it a safer airplane in that respect now looking at the interior of this aircraft it can seat a total of six people if you got all the seats in there including the two seats up front and here's the picture of the instrument panel back when these pictures were taken. We do not know if this, if the doctor has modified this panel as a lot of people are going to uh, full electronic displays now, but this is what we call the old school six pack steam gauge instrument setup. Six pack meaning the six primary flight instruments are right there lined up the way that you see them. Late model communications, comm radios, nav radios here, weather radar right here, and here is the original autopilot. I believe it's a Navomatic autopilot. So twin engine, dual everything, dual redundancy on vacuum systems, generators, and a backup set of instruments here on the standby instrument panel. From the FAA database, we can see the ratings for Dr. Sugata Das. First class medical, of 8 of 2020, 
Basic Med, 2017. Commercial Pilot, date of issue, 2014. He's got a commercial pilot, multi-engine instrument rating, and a private single engine rating. Here's the preliminary ADSB data from FlightAware, showing the flight from Yuma to San Diego. And it shows a very consistent 10,000 foot cruise, 10-5, heading westbound, VFR, and then a descent. And then things begin to get very unstable at the last portion of the flight with speed excursions from between 217 miles an hour down to 138 miles per hour, then back up to 230 miles per hour and down to 197, and then right back up to 250 plus estimated near the time of impact. So this portion here is representative of the aircraft being on autopilot. This portion here looks like the aircraft is being hand flown. Here's the airport diagram for the airport he was landing at, Montgomery Field in San Diego. So he was cleared for the ILS approach runway 28 right, that's this runway here. However, the active runway was runway 23, this shorter runway here, 3,400 feet long. So the clearance was cleared ILS runway 28 right, circled to land runway 23. Here's the instrument approach he was cleared to fly, the ILS runway 28 right with a circle to land runway 23. The weather at the time was 1,700 foot broken, 2,800 foot overcast. So there's a, a typical marine layer, probably 1,000 to 2,000 feet thick, that he's got to fly through to fly this approach. But he's got plenty of good weather below. The weather, In other words, the weather is well above minimums for this approach and well above minimums for the circling approach, which is 501. Unfortunately, he never got to the circling approach part of the procedure. Things started to go wrong intercepting the localizer for the ILS. So this more granulated ADSB data shows airspeed and altitude, date and time. And this section of the data appears to me, again, that the aircraft is on autopilot. The autopilot is connected and is helping him with this navigation as he's getting vectored around. Here's the airport he's trying to land at, Montgomery Field over here. Here's runway 28 with the extended localizer off the extended center line coming in right about through here. He ended up crashing just north of Gillespie Field, located right here, thus the confusion as to what airport he was heading for. So right about here, this looks to me like the aircraft was on autopilot, and then for some reason, he did not intercept the localizer course. He may have very well flown through it, and then started what appears to me to be a classic spiral descent of spatial disorientation to the right. More on that in a minute as we listen to the ATC audio tapes. Prior to where we picked this up with VAS Aviation, 2-2 Golf was conducting normal vectors and a descent to intercept the localizer. And 2-2 Golf was given the weather at Montgomery as 1,700 foot broken, 2,800 foot overcast, 10 miles visibility, landing runway 23. Now let's pick this up with Victor over at VAS Aviation. I highly recommend supporting his channel. I'm a Patreon supporter of Victor because he provides invaluable information to the aviation community. I've tried pulling this data together myself. It's an incredible amount of work what he does. There's 2 2 Golf, turn right heading 250, join final. 250, join final, That's that 30 degree intercept heading to join the 28 right localizer final. Again, this is edited for brevity. And uh, to the golf, do you say uh, clear for the ILS to it, right? Radar 47, turn left heading 180, join final. Left heading 180, join final, Radar 47. Okay, a little point of confusion on behalf of 2-2 Golf here. He was cleared to intercept final 
and then he will be cleared for the approach. He, 2-2 Golf is getting very close to the localizer right now. Your 2-2 Golf, you're four miles from Penny. The center maintains 2,800 until established on the localizer. Clear to ILS, runway 28 right, surf of the land, runway 23. Uh, clear for the ILS 28 right, uh, uh, for runway 23, 2 Golf. Yes, sir. Descend and maintain 2,800 until established on the localizer. 2,800 yeah. until established on the localizer. Greater 4-7, descend and maintain 4,000. Okay, massive confusion on behalf of the pilot there about what that clearance actually was. Cleared the ILS 28 right circle to land runway 23. It appears that the circle to land portion of that clearance baffled that pilot and all this is happening at the crucial moment of intercepting the localizer this is why flying a multi-engine aircraft one of these light twins especially a recip light twin solo in the weather is the most is the most demanding form of aviation you can partake in this is done this is made much easier in a 121 style operation where you have the co-pilot handling the radios for you and the pilot just concentrating on flying the airplane. So now with this little bit of miscommunication, a, a little bit of misunderstanding, Tutu Golf has now flown through the localizer course. It's likely that he did not properly set up the autopilot to intercept the localizer approach because of this momentary confusion, causing him to S turn or shoot through the localizer approach and now he's got to begin to hand fly the aircraft to get it back on course. Center maintain 4,000, ready for 4,000. Your T2 golf traffic, 2 o'clock, 3 miles southbound, 5,000 descending, 4,000 to C-130. They are restricted above you. Caution, wait, turn one. Copy, T2 golf. Your T2 golf looks like you're drifting right of course. Are you correcting? Okay, you can hear it in his voice. Completely task-saturated. Very clipped communications. The C-130 traffic is a bit of a distractor. He's up high. He's no factor. But in the meantime, he has S-turned through the localizer ap approach, final approach, and is deviating further to the right, of course, and continuing to descend. No. Two two golf, you're not even tracking the localizer. I need you to fly. It's actually cancel approach clearance. Climb and maintain three thousand. Two two golf. Three thousand. Two two golf. Maintain three thousand. Low altitude alert. Minimum vector in altitude in your area two thousand eight hundred. Okay, he's blown the approach. Now he's really the pilot of two two golf is very stressed. Now he's made the mistake of completely missing this approach from the beginning of the approach. But no harm, no foul. He can just climb up and get re-vectored back around for the approach. But this has put the pilot of 2-2 Gulf under an incredible amount of stress. Climbing 2-2 Gulf. Okay, now he's climbing. He says he's climbing when he, in fact, is not climbing. Raider 4-7, you're over hill. Cleared BOR or attack and alpha approach to Brown. So they are attack and alpha approach to Brown, Raider 4 seven. Or T2 Golf, climb and maintain 3,800. 3,800, group. That's 3,800. That's a typo on the slide there. He's still below the minimum vectoring altitude. He's still too low. Raider 47, contact Brown Tower, 128.25. Tower 1825, Raider 47, thanks, good night. Good night. Or T2 Golf, turn right heading 0, 9 or 0, re vectors to final. Okay, we're just going to do this all over again. Right turn to 090 degrees, and they're going to re-vector him around for final and try this again. So he's in the turn, in the weather, descending when he should be climbing. 2-2 golf, turn right hitting 090, climb immediately, maintain 4,000. 1,000, climbing immediately, 2-2 golf. He still insists that he's climbing when he, in fact, is descending. This is a classic case of the somatographic illusion portion of spatial disorientation. As you, as you accelerate forward, you push the throttles up on this high-performance light twin-engine aircraft, it's going to begin climbing and accelerating simultaneously with quite a bit of performance. That 
acceleration when you're in the weather, you can't see outside, is going to feel like a tremendous nose up, pitch up moment. So your natural human reaction, if you're not following the gauges, is to push forward on the yoke. Okay, it looks like you're descending, sir. I need to make sure you are climbing, not descending. Go for the pilot. He insists he is still climbing when he's descending. And again, you can hear both engines running just fine at a high, very high power setting. 22 Golf, stay altitude. Uh, 2500 to the Golf. 22 Golf, low altitude alert. Climb immediately. Climb the airplane, maintain 5000. Expedite climb. Climb the airplane, please. He's heading towards higher terrain up here to the north. At the same at the same time, descending in a right hand bank. In the weather. Air two two golf. Just level out the plane or the heading and climb the airplane up to five thousand when you can, sir. That's the supervisor jumping on the radio trying to save this pilot's life. Just break it down to the most simplest terms possible, level the wings and climb the aircraft. Ten o'clock and a half mile, one thousand five hundred. You appear to be descending again, sir. Are you say altitude? Yeah, two hundred is currently two nine or seven eight. After one two nine, traffic ahead half a mile uh, eastbound. Uh, tower and aircraft has crashed uh, about a half mile in front of us into the houses. Okay, that was the last we heard of two two Gulf. The helicopter traffic ahead witnessed the crash as the aircraft exited the clouds it's estimated that the cloud bases around here are about 1700 feet the higher terrain around there can be as high as a thousand feet when the aircraft came out of the clouds at a very high rate of descent he was basically in a unusual attitude recovery sort of situation a high amount of bank and steep nose down attitude and airspeed approaching 250 knots. We don't know if the pilot was attempting to recover from that unusual attitude at that time or if he had enough time to recover from that unusual attitude from that point. It would seem like with the ceiling of the clouds that perhaps he could have recovered the aircraft, but yet he didn't. Again, he was completely task-saturated and terrified at the prospect of what was going on. He was losing control of the aircraft in the weather and breaking out to an unusual attitude, high speed, nose down event. Was it some form of pilot incapacitation? Well, is spatial disorientation a form of pilot incapacitation? When you get spatial disorientation, you get extreme tunnel vision. You are terrified. Your world comes down to the smallest little gray circle, very similar to a G-induced loss of consciousness. Some of the first things that you lose when you get into such a tunnel vision state of terror is you no longer hear the radio. You no longer hear people talking to you. You are just trying to simply save your life. And when you're somatographic when your inner ear is telling you something completely different from what your instruments are telling you and you are not trusting and believing your instruments it is very hard hard if not impossible to overcome speaking of possible medical incapacitation carbon monoxide poisoning leads us to a quick review of the pressurization system in the Cessna 340 these Cessna aircraft are pressurized using the turbocharger off the TSIO 520 engines. The turbocharger drives a compressor, which compresses outside air to pressurize the cabin. There's only a mechanical connection between the turbocharger and the compressor. There is no way to get exhaust from the engines into the cabin using the fresh air pressurization system. Since twin-engine aircraft do not use the exhaust system to heat the cabin, they are equipped with a Janitrol or Trade Winds heater that runs off of 100-octane fuel located in the nose of the aircraft. This can 
produce carbon monoxide if not properly maintained. However, the weather during this event was too warm for the pilot to even need to use a heater. Regarding hypoxia, this flight was flown at 10,500 feet. Even if the pressurization was not working, it was not high enough nor long enough duration to induce hypoxia for this pilot. So I hope this gives you a better understanding of what happened to the Cessna 340A that went down in San Diego on 11 October. Again, we are here to learn from this, not to berate anybody. Please keep your comments civil in the comment section below. Thanks so much for your support of this channel, especially over on Patreon that make this content possible. If we get more information and additional NTSB reports, we'll keep you updated here. See you here.